The most common question I get asked when I talk to a patient regarding scoliosis is, what's causing it? Why do I have it? Or why does my son or daughter have it? And, and why is it developing and maybe in one of my children and not another? And there's a lot of theories and talk about what is the cause of scoliosis. Well, first of all, we have to understand that the biggest percentage of scoliosis cases, this is 80 plus percent of cases, is something called idiopathic scoliosis, which means the cause is completely unknown. And when it comes to the cause of idiopathic scoliosis, the theories associated with co what could be possibly creating the curve to develop in somebody's spine is very, very vast. There are many, many theories on what causes scoliosis down to you know, hormonal factors, toxic factors, environmental factors. There's even familiar or genetic theories on why scoliosis uh, could develop. And so the, the gist of it is, is that it's a multifactorial problem. And when we're dealing with a multifactorial problem that causes something to occur, isolating the cause may not 100% even be influential on the treatment, which we'll discuss in a second. But the main factor here is that we know it has something to do with the neurological system of the body because we definitely feel it's a symptom for another reason. Be the reason why we believe this is because there's other forms of scoliosis that we actually know the cause. And the ones that we know the cause of, had, there's many reasons why they could develop scoliosis with these other types of uh, syndromes or associations with scoliosis. So it just confirms the fact that scoliosis is a multifactorial problem, that there is not one reason that somebody would develop a scoliosis. We don't, we're 100% sure it's not 100% genetic either. We also know that genetics isn't the sole cause uh, because they've done studies on identical twins and they found identical twins not to have, or not to both the shared condition in about 50% of the cases. So we have people with the exact genetics, the exact same DNA with identical twins one patient would have scoliosis and one patient won't. And I've actually had patients that way. They have identical twins that they don't have scoliosis. And then even the ones they do could have different size curves. Like one could have maybe a 20 or 30 degree curve and the other one can have a 60 or 70 degree curve. So again, it shows you that there's another factor involved. It's not just genetic, but we do believe there is a genetic tendency. And we call that familiar. That's a predeposition that if you're exposed to the right factors or have the right the surrounding environmental effects that the scoliosis could develop. Hormones is a big conversation when it comes to what can cause scoliosis. And the reason why hormones are such a big talk because we know the progression of scoliosis is associated with growth or how fast somebody develops and that could be influenced by your hormones. However, can that actually influence treatment? Meaning that once scoliosis is developed and once we're seeing a, a, a significant size curve, if you balance hormones, would they would you resolve scoliosis? And I think that's the big question, which I think we'll answer a little bit later in, in the video. But the bottom line is when it comes to adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, there is no known cause. And if somebody tells you exactly what's causing it, they're literally just guessing. Um, so they, they really don't know. But when it comes to the spinal cord, I think that really talks about one of the main influences is that we do believe the neurological system is being stressed, stressed physically in length. And what happens is when the, at the critical moment of growth and development, the spinal cord is at its maximum uh, capacity of, of stretching. Well, what's causing the stretching is debatable and that's what we don't know. And therefore when they grow, if they continue to grow and the spinal cord doesn't develop with them for whatever reason, the body has to create curvatures to shorten the distance from the skull to the sacrum. And it does that by creating curvatures, got it? And therefore, that's why the faster they grow, the faster the curve develops. So the scoliosis is actually a defense mechanism, if we think of it this way, to help protect the spinal cord during these critical times of growth and development. So if we think of it as a neurological symptom or a neurological response to a, an underlying factor, then the body is doing it in a way to protect itself, much like a fever. Like the body will you know, create a fever to help fight off infection and bacteria and, and to, to bring down you know, whatever is causing that problem. So therefore, when people develop fevers, the problem will resolve itself and then the fever goes away and that's fine. However, with idiopathic scoliosis, whatever creates that scoliosis, the curve starts, the problem or the cause may resolve itself, but the curve stays. And that's what leads to 
adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. There, there, all those factors could be multiple reasons. Now, there are cases of scoliosis that we know what the cause is. And the most common type is something called neuromuscular scoliosis. Now, neuromuscular scoliosis is actually a condition, normally like a soft tissue condition. And these neuromuscular conditions can be widespread. There's many types of these neuromuscular syndromes. There's more than one or two. There's dozens of these. And these conditions can, uh, since they have a soft tissue disorder, can be associated with the development of scoliosis. These may be initially difficult to take care of because the soft tissue disorder is what's perpetuating the scoliosis. However, since there's many of them, and the, normally the syndrome that they're associated with it can't be resolved, the spine is normally treated separately. And that's normally the underlying thing when you're dealing with the syndrome, is a syndrome has many symptoms associated under one category, and therefore each each department, you would say, or each category of symptom is normally treated individually by their specialist. So I see lots of patients with neuromuscular cases, and we take care of their spine separately as their syndrome is being taken care of, or, their, or other symptoms of other facets of their syndrome are being taken care of separately. Another type is something called congenital scoliosis. Now, congenital scoliosis is truly genetic caused. This is where a patient is born with a malformed bone within the spine, something called the hemivertebra. They're born like this. this. This is actually a deformity that they're born with as an infant or as a baby. And since they have a bone in the spine that's not shaped like the other bones, that asymmetrical or unshaped bone that's not shaped properly will cause a curvature to occur at the site of deformity. And this is truly caused genital, uh, truly genetic caused scoliosis or congenital. This is not common. It's um, again, this is like five percent of cases or so. It's not a common cause, a common reason why we see scoliosis, but it does exist. And the last type is something called traumatic scoliosis, where somebody receives a trauma to the spine. It causes a shifting of the spine, and this can actually develop the scoliosis to develop. This is very related to trauma. This is not the most common cause of scoliosis identified in, in an adolescent or idiopathic scoliosis, but it is a cause. Now. Interesting enough, maybe some of these things, all the things I've talked about, could be some mild forms associated in the in idiopathic scoliosis or adolescent idiopathic scoliosis because could patients maybe have small traumas that are un or, or unidentified as a child that could maybe lead to some scoliosis later on in life? Yes, it's possible. It's impossible for us to completely be able to look at all those factors when we're seeing somebody, you know, five or 10 years later, the fact to know all the factors that were involved with um, when, when we look at a traumatic cause scoliosis. As you can see, scoliosis has many factors that can influence the cause. Now, here's the really big question. Does knowing the cause influence the treatment that you receive? Now understand that we look at every single case uniquely, and I've never seen two cases that are exactly alike. And we take all factors into consideration. But when it comes to scoliosis, actually understanding the cause may not actually influence your treatment at all. Because by the time we normally find scoliosis and diagnose scoliosis, the curve is already structural. And this is even true in small curvatures, 15, 20 degrees. Now, what do I mean by that? And that seems kind of like, well, what, why wouldn't you want to know the cause of your problem? And I like to talk about it like an earthquake, right? If you think of this earthquake, there is, we know exactly what causes an earthquake, right? The, the plates shift and the, the, the building, buildings fall, and we see all this destruction occurring structurally to the environment that the earthquake occur. Now, the fact there's structural issues that have occurred, you have to rebuild the buildings. Knowing the cause makes no difference in what we have to do now in order to rebuild it. So that's very similar what happens to scoliosis cases. Whatever causes the scoliosis kind of stops in most cases. We believe it resolves itself. But now we have a structural issue in the spine. And now the structural issue has to be taken care of independently. So even if all these issues were resolved after the fact, if you could find know the cause and resolve them, the spine isn't going to straighten out. You know, one one strong thing is this whole concept of neurotransmitters. This is like a real thing that's happening now. People, just, I actually believe patients are being exploited on this neurotransmitter concept. Let's say the neurotransmitter deficiency from some kind of nutritional deficiency was actually happened and then therefore that caused a scoliosis to occur in somebody's spine and they develop a 25 30 40 degree curve at that curve size if you were to rebalance all their neurotransmitter 
they will still have a 45 degree or 40 degree curve, whatever size curve they have, because balance of the neurotransmitter is not gonna correct the structural cause at that point. So normally with most cases, when we look at scoliosis, the cause becomes almost irrelevant by the time we diagnose them, okay? So really treating the spine appropriately is what's, what's really irrelevant at this point. So if you've ever been diagnosed with scoliosis or do you have, or you know anybody uh, that has been diagnosed with scoliosis, first of all, explore all your options, do research. But the most important thing is being proactive regarding your case, because we know all cases of scoliosis progress and they're gonna either progress rapidly in adolescent or slowly as an adult, but they're gonna progress. So being proactive is much better than just waiting and seeing what happens to your curve over time.